Thank you, Leon. What a joy to see you again. Greetings to all of you top women of South Africa. It is a privilege to join you today to look at leadership in times of uncertainty. I thought I could talk to you about using the EPIC Leadership Code to navigate radical uncertainty and adversity with grace. Have you heard about VUCA? I think it's a VUCA myth. Think about it. Uncertainty has always been the most certain thing in life. You and me know that every time we've had to fall, we had to reflect, reset, regain our confidence and move again. That's why we're in this room. So it's true that we are living through a time of uncertainty. It is also true that this time of uncertainty cre creates situations of adversity, but it's not the first time. Women that went before us did the same. The only difference probably is that our VUCA is far more radical. VUCA being uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. I think part of the uncertainty and ambiguity is uh, our confusing dawn. You, you've all heard about dawn. I hope you're not among those people who have suddenly started saying there is no dawn, because I do believe that dawn is the beginning of a new day. But how the day unfolds depends on what the people do. But talking about the dawn that is confusing. Let's think about violence against women. We've become one of the most violent societies in the world. Uh, in fact, when it comes to femicide, South Africa is the f has the third highest levels of femicide in the world. That's quite frightening. In fact, you must agree with me that violence and poverty are the greatest thieves of freedom, particularly women's freedom, since the dawn of democracy, the, the greatest thieves of women's freedom all over the world. But I do think that when women lead the way with grace, things begin to change. In front of me, I've got a picture of a beautiful woman who led with grace under equally volatile circumstances, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Her name was Charlotte Matwege village girl who led in a men's world, but she lived to tell the story. That's why today we celebrate her. She was the first female, a black female graduate. And she couldn't even practice in her field of science as a BSc graduate, but she found alternative ways to make a difference. And she's a pioneer in um, the area of justice, for all. She's a pioneer in saying that for justice for all to prevail, we need to ensure that we're not indifferent to difference and disadvantage. And in this case, she wanted us to be aware of the plight of children, migrant women, and um, black women in the middle of colonialism and apartheid. One of her contemporaries was Olive Schreiner, who equally led in times of adversity with grace. And she's the reason we are lawyers today, because she was able to influence and inspire the men of her time to pass or to change the Legal Practitioners Act so that women could become lawyers. Recently, I had a bunch of women, black, white, young, old, multi-generational come together and this was 2017 and said as women they want to lead the social justice quest and they want to heal the divisions of the past or to accelerate the healing of the divisions of the past so as to foster peace and prosperity or shared prosperity in our country. One of the lessons I've learned personally from life in climbing mountains is that the women like Charlotte McClagan and Olive Schreiner mm -hmm. who seem to 
move things forward despite adversity, uncertainty, and a constantly changing environment. They are the kind of people who dance with change without losing a sense of purpose, without losing integrity, without losing their impact consciousness and their commitment to serve humanity and the planet. They remind me of George Bernard Shaw when he said, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. This doesn't suggest we shouldn't complain when things go wrong. Lighting a candle is often about giving people a voice when no one will hear them. That is, women, for example, are poor. We have to make sure that we highlight that. Gender-based violence, we're moving forward now because there's been a Me Too movement. We're moving forward on um, Black Lives Matter because there is a, a, on race issues because there's been a Black Lives Matter movement. But what I would like to see going forward and what I've learned, though, about sustainable change is change that is anchored on justice for all, not justice as just us. In fact, the world is perverted, the world is in pain because those who sought change were very ethnocentric or egoistic. They only thought that the world needed to change to make things better for themselves. And in the process, they actually violated other people's rights. And what I learned personally from climbing mountains and from life generally, was that leadership that is sustainable and that changes things effectively and sustainably is leadership that is ethical, leadership that is uh, purpose-driven, impact conscious, and committed to change. In other words, what I have found myself doing all the time, particularly during my days as public protector, and now where I am at Stellenbosch University and with the Tumor Foundation, is to ask, is this ethical. In other words, is it the right thing to do? And is this the right way to do it? Is this in line with the purpose of the power I've been given? It could be it could be power that comes from positional power, or it could be leadership without a title. But is it in line with the world I want to create, the ecosystem I want to live in? Will I like the impact? Will the impact be fair to all? And is it in line with my commitment to serve the whole of humanity and the planet? We're training leaders at the Tumor Foundation that are anchored in this Epic Leadership Code. If you are involved with the Rotary Club International, you'd know what I'm talking about. Being driven by a code, being driven by um, values that you ask yourself at the beginning of your meetings and when you're about to make a decision, whether whatever you're about to decide to decide is in line with your values. So it's values-based decision-making or purpose-driven decision-making. And the way the epic leadership lessons I learned uh, panned out in the mountain, they actually saved me from um, being unable to summit. I found myself in, in Kilimanjaro in a position where at some stage they decided I must go home. And I had to decide whether I feel sorry for myself or I lash out in them and say this is unfair, play the victim and exhaust my energy because we're in the middle of the mountain, Kilimanjaro, or follow because good leadership is about followership. But as you are following people, you have to lead from wherever you are. You can read from the side, from the top, from below. And at some stage I was leading from below. And what is my concept of leadership? Leadership is about influencing and inspiring yourself and others to think and act in a particular way. And, and therefore it's always about moving people forward in the direction you want them to go. A lot of the times leadership is about non-communication or non-verbal communication. What you do is how you influence people. And I must say, what I learned though is the greatest leadership challenge for us as women and as human beings is the challenge of leading ourselves. And it was Edmund Hillary um, who said that we don't conquer, 
the mountain out there. We conquer the mountain within us. And that's what I learned when I was in the mountain, when I was on my knees trying to figure out what do I do now, given the fact that my feet had started to act like I borrowed them from a jellyfish. And my eyes were refusing to see, seeing about 10% of what needed to be seen. But what I learned was in those difficult times, you need to reset and reframe. For example, in the mountain, the key was I was leading these women. I had been asked to lead this particular challenge. Well, when I was told that I needed to go back home, they were gone. They all went up. And what happened was I had a feeling of a sense of shame. And you probably have felt like that, where you feel ashamed. But if you stay too long feeling sorry for yourself and ashamed, that's when you can't get up. Because it doesn't matter how many times we fall. It is how many times we rise that matters. Because it is said that falling is not failure and even failure is not final. But one of the things that I also learned in the mountain, just from other people, was the whole idea of an abundance mindset. That people were not there in a competitive way. People were there to get everyone on the mountain. And again, they reminded me of Charlotte McGregor's approach to say, if you must rise, take someone with you. And I've seen women in in this country doing that. I am where I am because of women. For example, I got the position as pop protector because South African women in dialogue that is led by Mrs. Zanelle Mbeki nominated me. I was in parliament as one of the drafters of the constitution because women such as Frini Chinala and Mavivi Manzini rooted for me to be part of that process. So what does it take though to stay firm, to collaborate with others and move forward despite adversity? I have learned from my, from mountain climbing and just life in general is that you've got to treat life as a series of mountains. As soon as you're finished with one mountain, as soon as you summit one mountain, you're back at the start. Look at me. I was pop protector. I'm back at the bottom of the ladder as a lecturer, and I love it and because I bring to this position a, a veteran's a wisdom, but I bring to it a newcomer, bringing people on board into something that we call a social justice booster plan, which was devised by women, by the way, and named after a woman, Palisa Musa, arrested at the age of 12 on June 16, 1976. Poor today, although she works hard, and women felt it can't be like this. We can make a difference and we can lead the way, not alone, but together. So what kind of mindset does it take for a person who is a two-mamina kind of person in times of adversity and who is willing to collaborate with others regardless of what they look like. What kind of mentality does it take to lead as an epic leader? I found that you need four intelligences. One is spiritual intelligence. The second one is emotional intelligence. The third one is social intelligence. The last one is intellectual intelligence. What I love, though, is that all of these intelligences can be grown. In the past, we were told that your intelligence can't grow. I mean, your intellectual capacity can't grow. Today, neuroscientists tell us we can grow it. We can grow our social intelligence by getting to understand the people we work with. If more women, for example, want to lead with abundance, we want to lead everyone into shared prosperity, we want to turn people around to stop hate, to stop violence, then we have to model the humanity we want to see in the world. We have to be at the forefront of being exemplary on Ubuntu. What does that take? It doesn't take just the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated, no. It also means treating them as they would like to be treated, which means understand everyone, try to walk in everyone's shoes. That is social intelligence. And we talk about racism, we talk about sexism, some of it is not intentional. It's people unconsciously biased and treating other people badly when they think they're treating them well. When you assume everyone needs what you need, 
uh, everyone rejoices at what you rejoice, then you don't understand people. You need to understand everyone and you meet them where, where they are. When the UN says leave no one behind, it means meet them where they are. Emotional intelligence is about checking our own intelligences to make sure that we, uh, we can withstand change. We have the kind of grit that allows us to fall, rise, fall, rise. And ultimately, what it has taken me to do these things, to climb mountains for social justice, um, it's really taken me the pursuit of what I love, which is justice the faith that I can do this and that other people can follow and that other people can join and that even though people do wrong things, there's goodness in many people and nobody is out to get me. That's faith in humanity. And lastly, hope. And I do know that we often think that people are out to get us. I personally have found out that people lash out at us out of fear. Even these extreme levels of violence against women. Yes, they're deplorable, but part of our response to that violence against women would be prevention. And prevention would be about sowing love, sowing self-confidence, sowing Ubuntu. And part of that requires us to be the first to model Ubuntu. And things like men are trash, in my book, they don't work. It takes a village to do the epic things that are often attributed to one person. And women like Charlotte McFayege led together across color, across class. But it didn't mean ignoring the different issues of the women. It didn't mean ignoring the different issues of black, white, village versus urban, but it meant finding common ground and this is what I found on the mountain was that finding common ground and collaborating is what allows people to summit. There is a glimmer of hope. Here we are, Standard Bank, top women has, have brought us here together. And we're together because already we're committed to being at the forefront of creating a better world, a world where there's justice for all and not just justice as just us. And this is part of what is referred to as generation equality. This is what is um, at the core of Black Lives Matter, sustainable development goals. Um, it's also something that is going to bring us together beyond COVID-19. And at Stellenbosch University and the, and the Tumor Foundation, we also believe that the Marshall Plan-like project that we have in mind the M plan for social justice is one of the things that is going to help us to break barriers while creating a more kinder world. Dear colleagues, thank you for this privilege. Honestly, the future belongs to those that dance with change and women tend to do this. Uh, there's a pity saying that uh, a mother holds the knife at the sharp Age. And I think women have done that. I'm not suggesting we should throw knives at them. I'm just saying that it is our time to lead and we can make the next decade a decade of shared prosperity and well-being for all. Thank you. Thank you. And God. May God bless you all. I'm waiting with joy to engage you during the question session.